All right, welcome to Humanize IT. Today I have two guest speakers on because I am super excited to go to Build It for the first time uh, this month. And uh, I love their the way that they're designing out this conference. So we have brought Sunny from IT by Design and Bill from Focus TSI to talk about how to appropriately build a MSP or IT service provider, so how to build it. So Sunny, tell me a little bit about uh, what this IT build it idea is and then why should we care? Yeah, no, thank you for having me here, Adam, and I appreciate it. And our partner, uh, uh, Bill uh, from Focus, I appreciate uh, your partnership. And so, you know, I started MSP in New York City in 2003, Adam, and it was like, you know, knocking doors up and down every floor in, in, the, in one just New York City building and talking to receptionists and, say, you know, asking for their call if they need any tech support. So that's how I started in New York City. And then 2008, fast forward, uh, we had a need for 24-7 by our finance uh, clients or financial sector clients and Wall Street customers. And I couldn't find any provider out there that could do 24 seven. And I'm like, you know, that's where I have unique experience. I was born in India and I moved here when I was 17 and I kind of built this global capability for myself for Knock that kind of led to a new market, which is a lot of my peer members and peer groups, they asked, they, they asked us for, you know, just to borrow my capability just for just on a friendly basis. And that became a product for MSPs. And we stopped selling to MSPs and only, became, you know, became MSP only channel, only knock. And that's like a little bit about IT by designs, uh, you know, uh, origin story. But one thing that with build it to your question is, from 2005, when I started going to these conferences, one thing that I always kind of really had problem with is going to these conferences, listening to the keynote, listening to a lot of thought leaders, you know, getting inspired. But when I used to come back and share those ideas with the team, team will get inspired from the overall thinking, but we didn't know how to implement that information in our business. And I'm like, you know, one day, if I will start the conference, I'm going to focus on tools and templates that go with the breakouts and session and the main stage. So that's what transpired uh, our overall vision for Build It. And Build It started a couple of years ago. Uh, this is our fifth one. And we do it from our heart. I think this is the only conference done by MSP. Otherwise, it's software companies on the vendor side. So we know because we are one of MSP peers that we know what the struggles are. We know what good looks like to serve a small, medium-sized business in a very demanding market like New York City. So the number one thing that we do at the conference is there is no sales pitch, it's all education, but education comes with a uh, booklet. And I have that here, Adam, I wanted to share this with you, that the booklet looks like this. So this is like one of the conference, and here is another uh, Build It uh, booklet conference. If you look through this, it's all templates, like business, how you do the evaluation, how you build a sales capability, how you do build like talent. So there are workflows and everything, and there's a hard copy in this booklet, and then we give a soft copy to all the attendees. So when they go back to their business, they're able to implement these best practices on day one. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited to be part of uh, Build It. I, I am a more pragmatic approach to IT. I, I want to like actually do things and uh, I'm new to the MSP uh, conference scene. So it's been a little interesting going to these and they're very spoon fed, vendor vendor focused. So I'm super excited to see what you guys are doing and how you're like, oh, we actually want to help MSPs grow. You know, we, how do you practically move forward? So, Bill, yeah, tell me a little bit about your MSP. Yeah, Bill, tell me a little bit about your MSP or your history here, so we can get some context for these questions we're going to talk about on how to build an MSP. 
Sure. So um, thank you, uh, Adam, again, and Sonny for the invite today. It's it's an honor to be with both of you. Um, so a couple things. Uh, Focus was founded in 1998. So uh, the company's history is very long. If you look at how much technology has changed since, you know, the late 90s to 2023, uh, you know, it's moving at the pace of innovation. So we're very proud of the fact that we've been able to uh, innovate the uh, organization with new technologies, innovate, change our directions and morph to what the needs of our business uh, clients are. Focus's history was uh, back in 1998, we were basically just a VAR, considered a value-added reseller. And quite frankly, we sold a lot of product and we gave away professional services to move product. That was back in the day when product was profitable and there was margins in it. Um, today, the products are much more commoditized. Uh, the margins that used to be there weren't there. And so as we went through, we uh, started first by really building a professional services organization where we could lead with consultation and services, which dragged product. So really a 180 from where we were. We used to do product and we'd give away services to move more product. Now we were leading with services and that was actually dragging product with it. And then again, the history of the company being very old, uh, as we started to go, we started need, seeing the need for more clients to have outsourced IT services, which you know are MSP or MSSP uh, type offerings. So we started to build those offerings internal to focus, and uh, you know, happy to say that our MSP is is probably the fastest and most profitable part of our business today. So if I'm hearing you correctly, like part of your success was adaptability. Absolutely. No question about it. Okay. Sonny, um, so for the first question here, how do we get to a successful um, uh, MSP? How do we build one? What does that look like? Because a lot of us, we're in our first MSPs. We're trying to figure out what does success look like? We're a great tech, but we're learning this business uh, model fly by night. So in my history of learning business and trying to get there, learning other people's failures and what success actually looks like is a key thing I was missing when I started my own company. What yeah. does success look like? So when you're talking to MSPs, how do most successful MSP providers start from scratch? Like how do they build those first 10 employees? And what does that success model look like? Yeah. How do I know when I'm winning? Yeah, no, the, the, thank you for that question. Great question. Uh, you know what? So over 20 years, what I have learned, Adam, is like from the beginning to like bootstrapping with just me being a tech to start with in New York City buildings, knocking doors to be a salesperson and a tech person, that the, the more successful MSPs, like from the building scaling point of view, uh, they focus on unique experiences for their customers. And this is why I say this. Like I visited Focus office just last week and the way I felt as soon as I walked into the office, uh, Bill's office and his team, that hospitality. And you know, as a partner, that was a memorable experience. And I'm sure when they are interacting with their customers, they are making hospitality as number one because everyone does customer satisfaction, client satisfaction surveys and focus on ticket surveys, other things. But there are only a few where they take the customer experience to the next level, people experience to the next level with hospitality. And that's the number one thing that I see that most successful business owners, they more focus on hospitality of people around them, that includes clients, employees, and their strategic partners. Because at the end of the day, it's people. And, and, and it's really, really important for us to understand because as, a, as MSPs, our product is basically the same. You're buying the same Office 365, you're buying the same tools, tech, tech stack, Majority of our tech stack is the same, SonicWall, WatchGuard, Cisco, to whatever our hardware software we are buying and reselling, resold services. And then we are packaging, we are pricing and packaging our service offerings on top of those technologies. The product is a commodity. What we sell is a commodity. 
The only thing that is a difference maker, a differentiator, a competitive advantage is what experience you create for the customer while you are creating value for that customer. And companies like Focus, where they focus on, I mean, they, they focus on the customer experience, the journey, and really creating that experience, then the same commodity, same commodity with the unique experience combined gives you competitive edge. That is what they're doing right. And they are, and then one more piece is in order to do that, you need culture, you need the right culture, leader creating that culture of hospitality and unique experiences on top of the commoditized products. And you need team around you. So they focus on a lot of high quality, high caliber talent. Building teams is their number one thing. So when I'm hiring like my first few people and I'm building this culture, am I just hiring these uh, tech and sales hybrids? Am I trying to, um, uh, what kind of, uh, what, like what would my first four hires look like? Yeah. So if I have limited budget to only do four hires, I, I will first of all do my self-assessment. Like what is my unique strength? My unique strength is technical or sales. Where do I need to contribute? Where can I contribute effectively and outsource the rest of the things to the other four people? So I will start with understanding my unique strengths, my superpower, and then say, okay, I'm going to contribute. I'm going to work 40 hours, 60 hours, whatever hours that we do as entrepreneurs, but I'm going to work with, within my unique ability and I'm going to create a team to do teamwork for other things and those other things needs to be outsourced to them. So that, that's the first thing that I will do. I will do my assessment and see what do I need and then I will make strategic hires and those strategic hires can be techni technical people if I'm good in sales and marketing and, and do that more. I will probably do three technical, one person who I can start developing slowly for, as a future leader. And if I'm good technical, which I was in the beginning with the computer engineering background, then I will do a little bit more VCIO, technical, the strategic roadmaps for technology. And I will probably do, you know, you know I will do more um, uh, sales side. If I'm more technical, then I will probably do two sales marketing people and two technical people because I can contribute better as a strategic technology thinker. Nice. I love that. I was going to ask you what your superpower was. <laughs> yeah, it has been keep evolving. And now, <laughs> what I realized is that my superpower, my unique ability is uh, solving uh, problems and overall, like, you know, 10x thinking that seeing what others don't see is really, and, and it's re I, I, can, I can do that in any part of the business, but it's more of thinking different, thinking again, and not really accepting the norm. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the out-of-the-box thinking is 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 definitely a skill set. Um, I, I just got done talking on another podcast about the white wall tires. Why do you why do you wrap the, the tires? Because we have to protect the white walls. Like there are no white walls on tires anymore. <laughs> you know, like the <laughs> process thinking versus the let's think about how to move forward. Yeah, uh, Bill, I want to start with you on the next question is, what are those pivotal moments? So I hear people talk about, oh, your first million dollars is your pivotal moment or your first 10 hires is your pivotal moment. When in your experience in a, in a high growth MSP, a successful MSP, what are those moments that you experienced that were pivotal to your success? So I... I I'm going to answer this question, I think, in two ways, right? So the first is uh, specific to focus. Uh, again, being founded in 1998 and coming from a uh, traditional bar that was moving a lot of product and then eventually doing a lot of consultative professional services, our pivotal moments were measured by when percentages of our business were starting to get dominated by our MSP offering. So, you know, at one point, as an example, we were moving probably 80% hardware, 20% professional services. We decided to become an MSP 
And now all of a sudden MSP represented 1% of our overall revenue or our overall business. So we did a lot of measurements and moving that we wanted um, the percentage of revenues from our business to either be MSP or um, professional services consultative based. And then, you know, taking the reliance of hardware and profitability of hardware off the table. So that's, that's what I would say our first um, pivotal moment was. I think, I think if you take it from building an MSP from scratch, which we again did not do, I mean, we did build the MSP, but we did it through a company that was functioning. And, you know, I like to use the, I, you know, I told our CEO one day, I said it would be kind of easy to just start a brand new business from scratch rather than trying to, you know, morph the business that we're in today. And, yeah. Um, that's an entire another podcast I can give you on why that was. <laughs> you and um, I can both <laughs> talk a lot on that one. <laughs> yeah, I, a real lot on that one. But I think um, in terms of uh, pivotal moments we saw, I think it was when, you know, whatever your definition of critical mass was, but where we divide, you know, put some KPIs in place. So customer acquisition, you know, we set a target that we wanted to acquire at least new two new customers a month. So when we started to do that, um, you know, that was a pivotal moment for us. Um, offerings in our MSP. So, you know, we would put a KPI around a specific offering and say, okay, we want this offering to grow at a percentage rate or a certain area. So we really looked at those as, um, you know, the pivotal moments of, of defining where we wanted the organization and the offering to land. And then based on that, you know, measuring it with either numbers like customer acquisition, revenue, uh, adoption, things along those lines. So those were kind of the key pivotal moments, I would say, where we knew we had it right or we knew we had it wrong. So in that example, we said we wanted to acquire uh, two customers per month. We wanted that to be able to happen within the first six months. And after about six months, we noticed, you know, we were getting one customer every other month. Well, you know, you got to go back and inspect that and figure out what you're doing wrong there. Oh, nice. Uh, Sonny, any thoughts on pivotal moments within MSP's growth? Yeah, so I think the within, so there is a glass ceiling after every few million dollars that you add. And so first, so personally, what I have experienced is uh, the, the first one was around at 1 million mark, and then it was about 2 million mark, then it was about between somewhere 5 to 7 from the revenue point of view. And, and when I go you know, when I reflect on the journey and what I realize is that all those pivotal moments were based on my bets and guesses and the highest payoff where we kind of really uh, was, we were able to break that gla glass ceiling is it was a good hire. Like it was, it really came down to betting on someone, a person, it, you know, the, from the talent point of view, that they brought in a new perspective, new superpower, uh, and their overall work ethics to everything that you just ended up finding, for example, a good salesperson or a good technical person who's doing just so, you know amazing job that word of mouth, referral-based business gave you growth. So it was, for me, it was mainly my bets at each one of this glass ceiling stage on people is what helped me. And that's, um, yeah, that's what I want to share. Maybe, you know, like when we started acquiring, for exa example, customers without me knocking every single door in the New York City buildings and, you know, doing uh, what do we, you know, like just going to buildings to find new business and someone else was there to do that where I didn't have to be the only one acquiring customers. And the, the other piece is when I had like some, like, you know, sometimes the, the, the growth and profitability is, you know, hard to predict the, the, in terms of consistency. So when I had a little bit of operational maturity where I could predict at least with a good percentage in terms of consistent year over year growth and EBITDA or profitability, then I'm like, you know, I have a capability that I don't need to do this with muscle and feel. That was another pivotal moment that business can, 
I was I'm able to build a business. It's not 100% dependent on me. It's, it's, it, it has its own systems that will make it uh, self-transform. We we talk about with Humanize um, IT, like with uh, the Mai Tai on the beach scenario. You know, you should be able to run your business from the beach with a Mai Tai in hand because <laughs> you you your business does not require thought from you. You can be gone. And we work really hard to help people get there because Adam is lazy. It's one of my core attributes. It's one of the great virtues, you know, hubris and patience. That's your superpower? That's your superpower? <laughs> I, I like to empower other people so that they can yeah. do their jobs yeah. well. <laughs> if, you, if you're reading like the Pearl Handbook for coding, like as computer engineer, like in the back of the Camel book, it says the three great virtues of a programmer are laziness, impatience, and hubris. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, empowering people, getting to that point where you can offload uh, tasks and you see that MSP running. I think that's the difference between a great leader and a great engineer. A great engineer can do it all. A great leader will empower others to do it. Yep. And I think that's when you really start seeing people shine. You know, we, we look at hundreds of MSPs and we're like, the ones that are doing well are sitting there empowering. How can I help my people? How can I find that next great hire, the next great superpower? I love that phrase, superpower, the next great superpower <laughs> for my business. Uh, Adam, I just want to add one thing to what you just shared. Uh, uh, I just read a book. Uh, it's called Who Not How by Dan Sullivan. And to, to, to the example that, you know, engineer will do everything and the leader will say, okay, who can do this better than I do and who can I give it to? So his like simple book name is Who Not How, highly recommended book. It just changes your thinking. Like you don't have to start with how, you should start with who is the best player in your team that you can be a quarter, good quarterback, but give, give the ball to them. So who can do this for you is, is a, it's a great book. So we get time for like one or two more questions here before we conclude for this. Um, I want to ask you both, uh, and I don't know which one wants to take it, uh, but what does that successful MSP culture look like? You talked a lot about that earlier, about um, having that right person, having the right culture in place, caring about your clients and what they're doing. Um, is it like a narrow vertical? Should you spread broad? Like, should you be hiring people in just one, you know, like, should we be meeting with our clients regularly? Should we be uh, bringing them donuts? Uh, what does that culture actually look like that is successful? Like, how do I know that I'm, I'm building a good MSP culture? Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll start, Sonny, and then you can jump sure. in. Yep. So, so I think the, the key here, right, is that uh, an MSP, and Sonny kind of touched on this in the beginning, I'm not going to steal verbatim the exact words he used, but it, it is a customer service organization. So the culture has to be around servicing the client. And the uh, employees within the MSP must really, the, the culture you must build internally, you know, Sonny used the term hospitality, but... The, the culture internally has to be creating that customer experience and also within that customer experience, it's got to be a customer service culture. Uh, now, what is that service? That, that service is different um, all the time. You have your core offering. Don't get me wrong. You're, you're providing a value. It might perform technology or whatever. But at any given time, what a customer might be looking for may not be MSP or IT related. They just might need help. They might need the situation. And you need to have that customer service mentality uh, to lead with. And I think if you can get the culture around that, you know, the culture might be, to your example, um, hey, you know what? This customer just went through a cyber attack. Things aren't going very well for them. We're getting them back into a good spot. Um, they need to know that we're there for them. So it might be, hey, you know what? I'm going to show up on site and I am going to bring that box of donuts. And I'm going to let the, that business know that we are there for them. And we're here to demonstrate that. So, um, you know, I take a lot of lessons out of service industry in general. If you look at companies like Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A is an example. If you've read any of their books and their success of their business model, 
you know, here's a company who came out of nowhere to be number two in the fast food industry, you know, passing companies like Wendy's and Burger King. And they got there through customer experience, right? Uh, they train their employees. You don't say thank you. You say my pleasure. You know, if you've uh, ever had the Disney experience, you know, Disney is all about performing for the client and getting that customer experience. So the culture, in my opinion, has to be a customer success, customer service culture. And then what comes of that, quite frankly, comes naturally because the clients will almost tell you what they need or what they want at that time. And uh I, I think that's the differentiation. I really do. I think it's it's leading first with customer service. We're here to service you. Uh, and if you can get that culture, that makes a big difference. Uh, Sonny, anything to add there? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Bill. Uh, that is, I mean, I, uh, I'm completely aligned with what uh, Bill shared in terms of, uh, you know, the focus on basically the experience. And 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 from you know just using my words and, and thinking how I think about this is at the at the end of the day is people around you. It could be a customer, they're people. Yep. Yeah, your employees, they're your people. Your any vendor partner, strategic partner that you're working with is people. So if the mindset can be uh, people first, and yeah. you know you used uh, Chick Fil A's uh, example, Bill. Uh, Some part of uh, John C. Maxwell group where uh, he he comes there as well, and John C. Maxwell will say, add value to people. Like if you are making other people a priority, other people first, not individualistic, you know, self-centric uh, approach, this people approach. Uh, then you can, you know, everything else can be built upon that thinking, adding value to people. So the way I think about like overall from the the, the company culture point of view or workplace culture, yes, the check writer, the customer who is keeping us in business. So let's take care of those people first. And in order for us to take care of those people, the complete care, you need to have the connection, you need to have relationship, you need to have good collaboration going on with them. You need to have respect for each other and the relationship overall investment, the time that you need to invest to build those relationships and the values, because it could be a customer, it could be an employee. If value system is not aligned, then there is going to be friction. So you got to, first of all, be very clear with your own values, who, what do you, who you are, what you're building, what are the mindsets. And a couple of mindsets that we use here at ITBD is that uh, it's more positive focus, adding value to people, and it's more learning and winning culture that you're either learning from your mistakes or you're winning because in order to create an entrepreneurial culture internally, which serves the customers well, you need to be able to allow people to make mistakes and learn from mistakes as long as they're not repeated more than two, three times. Not the same mistake. Well, but you more learn learn than others. <laughs> yeah, so learning and winning culture, entrepreneurial attitude, an entrepreneurial mindset for everyone. But happy people internally will make happy people outside. So if your people are grumpy, they are not positive focus, they are not showing up with the right mindset, there is no way for anyone to create customer experience, which is the right positive experience. So the point that I'm making is it starts internally from within. It starts with the leader. And in order to create, uh, in order to create the right experience for, for people around you and, and from the customer's point of view, you have to be able to create that internal so happy pe- happy employees, happy customers, happy employees, happy other strategic partners. So everything is interrelated. When it talk when when you look at any business, there are three pillars. There is an employee pillar, which is people. The business is built on that. You have the customers that are the second pillar, and the third is your strategic partners, like you know uh, Bill and I. Both are strategic partners, and we are also the client partner. I mean, you know, he's our client. And so those three pillars, the foundation is for any business is those three pillars. At the end of the day, it's people. Happy home, happy room. 
<laughs> That's awesome. I think uh, if I were to wrap up this uh, so um, we can get you guys on the road, we can talk about like how IT providers, when you're just starting out, if I'm getting from both of you, the focus should be on your setting up your culture, setting that and everything else will fall in line. And then next week, what we're going to talk about is the future of IT. What should you be focusing on over the next five years or so? Because whether I think most people can agree on this, the, the wind is changing. We are in a season of change in technology. And what does that look like? How are you supposed to be building for the next few years? And we're going to talk about it in next week's podcast. Thank you for coming on, uh, Bill and Sonny, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.